Welcome to this session called Global Development. Why should we fo what should we focus on? And how will we measure success? Big, big issues. My name is Pamela Hartigan. I run the Skoll Center here at Said Business School and uh, work with the Skoll Foundation on putting the forum together. So I'm delighted to be here to what we hope will be a highly interactive, highly dynamic session. Um, we're going to be having some people be talking about why are these goals important um, and certainly getting all of your thoughts on that. And the way we're going to run this session is that I'm going to be posing questions to each one of our panelists. Um, they will have a few minutes to respond. And then we're going to hear from practitioners, leading practitioners on the ground in terms of are these goals of any use to them? When we talk about you know, the SDGs, the MDGs, the Copenhagen Consensus, the SPI, the blah, 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 how useful is it to them? And then uh, what we'll do is open the floor to your um, issues, questions, um, challenges to, to all, of, all of us. So let's talk a little bit about these rankings and, and these indicators. They basically are supposed to be highlighting priorities and track progress. Um, in terms of, you know, over a period of time. And a lot of these goals and, and uh, the like play a crucial role in determining where development dollars, where national priorities are going to be focused. So for that reason alone, they're very, very important. But a lot of the problems is that rank order data that purport to represent the past or projected performance um, really oversimplify very complex social phenomena. I think that that's one of the issues that we're going to be talking about in this session. And then in addition to that, um, that oversimplification process, it makes the information presented appear much more robust than it actually is. So the challenge is also how do you implement this on the ground? We're going to be talking about that. And then finally, one of the most important criticisms about uh, establishing top-down targets is that everywhere is different. The local context really matters in the situation. So how do entrepreneurs that are working on the ground actually find these targets useful or not in advancing their own very specific work? So with us to discuss these is uh, Bjorn Lomborg from the Copenhagen Consensus. We have Michael Green from the Social Progress um, Imperative, and um, Thomas, remind me of your last name, say it. Christensen. Thank you. OK, sorry, very simple. From, UN, from the UN with the um, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, then commenting on these uh, issues, we'll, we will have Dorothy Stoneman from Youth Build, Patrick uh, Ewa from Ashesi University in Ghana, and Bunker Roy from Barefoot College in Tolonia. Um, I'm going to be asking each respondent to keep their uh, responses to five minutes. So this will be a challenge. Um, Bjorn, policymakers look for very easy answers. Okay? And so what you have done is come up with a really simple way of having them sort of <coughs> assess, this is where you should be putting your money you know, to get the most bang for your buck. Um, and your latest publication, which is entitled The Smartest Targets for the World, which I think there are copies here for people, you know, who want to want to look at it, um, uses really voluminous expert studies and uh, that, and certainly Nobel Prize winners, et cetera, that have looked at these findings. But when you look at this book or when you look at what's going on there, very few policymakers are really going to dig deep to look at each one of these issues and how you came up with the assessments that you do. And one of the things that you point out in that book is that the poorest countries have really lousy data. And so given the fact that so much of what you're doing uh, in the Copenhagen consensus de you know, depends on data, talk a little bit about you know, this approach of cost-benefit analysis and how can policymakers and the rest of us really have confidence in the kinds of results that you're presenting. Yeah. 
Uh, thanks a lot. That's a, it's a great question, and obviously it hits right home on, on, on the main issues. Uh, just to give you a, a quick sense of what it is that we've done, we basically asked lots of economists to look across all the different areas, 22 different areas, to look at where can you do the most good for every dollar or for every pound or every euro or every uh, taco, whatever your currency is called. How much social, environmental, and economic good are you going to create? And so, yes, it creates what you say is a very easy answer. I, I worry a little bit. Politicians are not looking for easy answers. They're looking for popular answers. And so in some sense, what we try to battle is uh, most politicians you know, look at the issues where there's either uh, really cute animals or there are lots of crying babies or there are groups that have great PR. And what we tend to think is, well, some of the things that are most important in the world are actually the ones that are also quite boring. And so in some sense, we try to put them all on an equal footing and saying, where do you get the biggest bang for your buck, as the Americans like to say, but really just where do you get the most social good for every dollar invested? And sorry, I'm just going to say dollars, but that's just right. a shorthand for whatever currency okay. we're talking about. Um, so what your question goes to is, do we actually know? You know yes. Do we have the data? And, and in some sense, no, of course we don't. There's lots of data we don't have. But we're not trying to, and, and, and I'll just say, you can actually get the book over here. I think we'd love to get your card in exchange. Uh, and, and we probably don't have enough card, uh, uh, books. So the ones who get too late, you can get an e-copy. We'll send you a, a, a copy. So sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but, but what we try to do is to say, how much bang for each buck do you get? And our question is not, did you get $3 or $3.5? It's much more, did you get $3 or $30? Or maybe only 30 cents or even 3 cents? It's an order of magnitude con uh, conversation. And there, I feel a lot more comfortable. So yes, we do need better data. We absolutely need better data. But we should also recognize we have plenty of data now to sort of distinguish between the targets mm -hmm. that are really, really good and the ones that are you know, OK good, the ones that are really just mediocre, and some which are actually probably counterproductive. Mm -hmm get into this space? Ah, uh, I mean, this, the simple answer is I, I wrote uh, a long time ago uh, a book called The Skeptical Environmentalist oh, yeah, um, right. on, uh, on, you know, we have this idea that the world is just getting worse and worse. But in many aspects, certainly not all, but in many aspects, things are actually getting better. And that's important to point out. Um, and then I made the argument with, with climate change that we were very, very focused on the Kyoto Protocol, which uh, back then, that was what everybody was talking about, probably cost about $180 billion. It would probably, if everybody actually did what they promised, uh, would cut uh, uh, temperatures by, uh, you know, it would probably postpone global warming at the end of the century mm -hmm. by five years, let's say. Um, and so my con conversation was to say, but shouldn't we look at what else we could spend $180 billion on? And it just turned out that you, you can actually, $180 billion is pretty much what it would cost, at least back then, to give everyone in the world clean drinking water and mm -hmm. sanitation once. And so my argument was just simply, isn't it strange we're going to spend this every year for the rest of the, the century, and yet just one year could actually solve one of the huge problems in the world? Now, those are not, you know, that, that just happens to be the same number, 180 billion. So clearly, you shouldn't just be looking at that. And so I really got into this whole conversation. We start saying, surely there should be sort of a ranking list around the world. What are smart things? What are not smart things? And, and surprisingly, there's not. And I think I know why. The simple answer is, if you say these are incredibly important and incredibly efficient solutions, everybody who does that love you for it. But of course, it also means saying some things are not as good. Well, yes, people did not like you very and much. And everybody, of course, <laughs> dislikes the fact that, they're, that we're pointing out some things are not very efficient. Uh, and, and so it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a terrible way to win friends and gain influence. So, so, um, well, but but you know, I, th I think it's an important thing to do. Good. Thomas, um, in September, the world's 193 governments are going to meet in New York. And they're basically going to you know, agree or not with a set of very ambitious goals for 2015 to 2013, uh, 2030, uh, uh, following on the MDGs or Millennium Development Goals. Um, now, it's, there's no real precise figure on what it's going to cost to do these SDGs, and we talked something between one trillion and six trillion, depending on whether it's ODA that goes in with national budgets, and depending on whether, in fact, you also include, you know, private investment. But unlike the MDGs that had eight goals and 18 targets, the um, SDGs 
this is what The Economist says, um, they have 169 goals, and they are worse than useless. Um, and they note that it's full of good intentions, but everyone knows where good intentions lead. Um, now, Bjorn's Copenhagen Consensus Center's expert group ranked those targets, and they selected the smartest down to 19. So tell us about the process that you went through to come up with 169 goals. It got to be such a monstrous list. How did that happen? Well, just a slight correction. It's 17 goals. Oh. It's 169 targets. Ah, still. And, and, and what is actually important are the 17 goals. OK. The 169 targets is, is the next tier down. And, okay. and then under that, there will actually be indicators. And, and that process of settling both targets and indicators isn't done yet. And probably maybe the targets will be finally agreed by the time of the summit in September. But the work on the indicators, including with the statisti right. statisticians of the UN and, and global experts in statistics are still ongoing and will go on for quite a while. Um, the 17 goals, what, what you have to uh, be cognizant of is that the eight goals from 2000 mm -hmm. were development goals, whereas what we're uh, setting out on now is, a, is an agenda that is global, universal, and as applicable in the US or the UK or Denmark mm -hmm. as it is in, in Mali or Botswana. And, and, and that has a major impact because mm -hmm. the eight goals were primarily social goals, right. focused on, on poverty alleviation and uh, combating hunger and, mm -hmm. and uh, bringing girls into schools, uh, maternal health, uh, and, and so on. Whereas the sustainable development goals also are about uh, the use of energy, uh, food production, consumption, infrastructure development, and, and things that matter everywhere in the world. So in a way, 17 goals as an agenda of priorities that covers uh, north, south, big, small, right. landlocked, uh, uh, small island development states. It's, it's not a very large list. If you, if you thought about bringing 193 countries' ministers of finance together and make them uh, have a list of priorities, I'm sure that list would be much longer. So, so that the world's countries have been able to narrow this down to 17, or in fact, it's, it's, it's really 15 goals plus a 16th that is about the rule of law and governance and what kind of uh, system you need to have in place in order to be able to mm -hmm. deliver. Uh, and then the 17th one is, is about the means of implementation, finance, mm -hmm. technology, data, partnerships, and so on. And, and I think that that is not a very long list. And, and half of them are, in fact, the Millennium Goals, mm -hmm. the poverty goals that were not reached. Because remember, uh, we, we are in 2015, but for many of those goals, it was about having poverty right, or right I mean right. so there's still some way to go to fulfill them you you said something to me interesting in our phone conversation when we talked about this session and you said how long it took governments to actually get going on the MDGs talk a little bit about that process well I mean you also have to be aware that the MDGs were in a way a very top-down a closed chamber process uh, the Millennium Declaration from the year 2000 doesn't even mention the MDGs. It was done behind closed doors amongst a few experts in statistics right, and, right. and indicators who, who over a year developed these goals and then they were sort of fed into the UN system and took until 2005 when there was another summit when they then sort of became household names and then after that yet another two or three years before governments had mm -hmm. sort of included them in their planning processes and the global UN, both mm -hmm. UN system and ODA donors, right. had integrated them into their work. So not until 2008 did the world really get going, which, I mean, And how is that different? How, what was the process now, now? Now we expect many governments already to be tuned in on starting implementation, sort of hitting the ground running uh -huh. uh, as of January 1st next year. Wow. Um, clearly, there will be a major task for everyone to yeah. get this yeah. done. And, and also because the financing of the MDGs was primarily supposed to come from ODA, mm -hmm. this time around, as you also it's indicated, right. it's a much more complex uh, financial picture that we're looking at. Right, right, right. Now, Michael, to you, um, over the last three years, the SPI, or Social Progress Imperative, has published this Social <coughs> Progress Indicator. And I just got an email yesterday, the day before, that you've just put out the next, you know, the next iteration of that. Um, and it basically, uh, you know, gets away from relying on a country's GDP, 
um, as the measure of progress of human and social development. And it really examines very distinct dimensions of uh, social progress along basic human needs. So um, those needs are around the excess of, um, uh, of foundations of well-being and opportunity uh, along with basic human needs. So shed light a little bit for us, uh, to us on how those SPIs uh, went about collecting data on these very elusive targets. How do you do that? Mm. Well, let me just make um, a framing observation first. There was a, uh, I think it was about 18 months, two years ago, there was a, a change in how the governments uh, of the world were told to calculate GDP. Uh, and this was a change that was to start calculating things like prostitution and, and drugs in, as part of GDP figures. And at the time, there was a great uh, uh, interview in The Economist magazine with the former head of the Italian statistical agency, Enrico Giovannini. And he said, you know, people think that measuring well-being is hard. They haven't tried measuring GDP. And I must admit, I get quite frustrated. I go around the world talking about the Social Progress Index, and people say to me, oh, well, these social indicators are very interesting. They're not like real numbers like GDP. It's like, <laughs> rubbish, you know? GDP was not handed down from God on tablets of stone. It's a statistical, <laughs> yeah, it's a statistical tool that was developed 80 years ago and is undergoing refinement. And I think we have to understand that, is that it's, and it's not finished. I mean, GDP was telling us our economies were fine until they fell off a cliff in 2008. Yeah. And then if we look at other kind of financial measures, you know, stock prices were telling us that Lehman Brothers was a great bank before it collapsed. So I think we have to give up a bit of this sort of, you know, idea that the, the finance and economic world really has got measurement right yeah, yeah, and right. the social sector good sort point. of sucks. Very good yeah? I think I would say on social measurement, we have a glass half full and maybe on economic measurement, it's two thirds full. They're both projects that need to be completed. And, there's, and since the projects will never be completed, we'll always have to reform and improve and change the way we measure things to respond to the challenges in the world. But we have to try. And so the Social Progress Index is an attempt to do that, to integrate 52 different measures of how a society is performing into one single measure to really sort of capture holistic understanding of, of how a country is doing. Now, I will happily uh, spend the next half an hour in tears telling you all my pain about the things that I would love to measure better. Yeah? I, mean, I mean, it's just shocking. Name three. Name three. Well, I, I mean, the fact that we cannot get any data on educational attainment across, across the world. We can get it for some countries, but not for everyone. Because one of the problems we have um, is this thing about this, all this data apartheid in the world. We have OECD data, and then we have UN data that's very focused on the MDGs. There's a whole data gap. So that's one thing I'd really like to, uh, I think we should, we should be measuring better. Um, I think uh, another thing I'd love to measure better is actually disability. Not how many people pay, are disabled, right. but actually what's the quality of life for people living with disabilities. If we think about the demographic shift, you know, Hans Rosling's brilliant presentation right. a few years ago, if we're going to be living in a society with so many more older people living with disability and fragility, we've got to be able to manage with judging a good society what the quality of life and is. And are you including mental health in that? And mental health. Mental health, we, uh, yeah, I'd love to measure, but we're using in the model uh, suicide rate as a proxy for mental health only because it's the only available proxy. We know it's not great. Right. And the, on the other hand, so there's, there's lots and lots of problems. However, you know, what we can do with statistics is combine different indicators to help eliminate noise, mm -hmm. you know, and deal with sort of issues. And we did a bit of work recently. I mean, the OECD produces a lot richer data sets for their countries. They produce something called the OECD Better Life Index. Mm -hmm. And so we actually ran a simulation exercise looking at our index for the OECD countries against theirs, adjusting for the different right, methodologies. Right. And the results were very, very close. Interesting. So actually, we'd got a pretty good approximation. Now, we've got to keep testing that, keep improving that. So I think this idea of this fatalism that, oh, the data's all terrible and we can't do anything right. is completely wrong. The data's got to be improved. It's a massively important global public good that ain't sexy. Yeah, and doesn't get the attention it needs, but we've got to keep pushing that. Yeah. And then secondly, I think I'm really excited about how new technology can plug some of these yeah, gaps sure, as well. Yeah, sure, sure. Let me continue along this line uh, of questioning, just in terms of looking at the big challenges of, of uh, you know, the MDGs, the SDGs, the Copenhagen consensus, et cetera, is that whole process of how you know, you actually get many stakeholders involved in achieving, in achieving these. And I think we talked about that too, Thomas, and certainly I know the Copenhagen consensus probably has also that issue of how do you motivate people around these. 
But the SPI has an interesting way of actually having done things a little bit differently in that regard. Talk a little bit about how you've collected that data. How are you getting stakeholders at the country level involved in looking at this? Well, we very much see the Social Progress Index as a piece of open source technology that people can take and use and refine. So we've said, you know, there's a basic structure of the model, the three dimensions you talked about, basic human needs, foundations of well-being, and opportunity, under which there's four components. And we say, think of those as 12 questions you have to answer in the most relevant way with the best with available data for your community. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite honestly, this wasn't an innovation we made. It was an innovation made by our partners in Brazil, Amazon, mm -hmm. took that framework, collected data from other sources, put it together in clever ways and created a social progress index for 770 new municipalities in the Amazon region. Mm -hmm. And then basically that can be now adapted to cities it can be adopted to regions. Right. It's been adopted by the European Commission, are gonna do it for the regions of Europe. And we can take it all the way down from a global measure, a country measure, a state measure, a city measure, a community measure, which is work that Coca-Cola is now pioneering, and Fundacion Paraguaya, Martin Bert, who we all know and love, taking it down to the household level. Hmm. So a flexible structure that keeps the, uh, the basic conception of social progress but flexible at different levels, which then makes it a tool that becomes a shared common language about where we want to go. And talk a little bit more about the application of that. I mean, other than Amazon, where else have, has, is this being used in actually driving changes in the way things are being done? Well, I think we stumbled across a really uh, powerful change model, which I don't think we, we'd realized, which was that a key feature of the Social Progress Index model is we have no GDP in it. So Human Development Index, OECD Better Life Index, Bhutanese Gross National Happiness tend to mix together economic and social indicators. We s separated out the social environmental measurement from the economic so we can look at the two of them together. Right. I think Amartya Sen actually had the idea back in the 70s, yeah. but you know, we're all disciples of Amartya Sen. Um, and what that's meant is that the social Probably progress... <laughs> we're all disciples of Amartya apart from Bunker. Um, but then there's a, what that allows us to do is that the social progress index, we don't have to say stop measuring GDP. We can say carry on measuring GDP, that's useful to you, but this goes alongside. Yeah? And so you actually are complementing policy. So this is why we're finding that governments like the government of Paraguay now have a national plan that has a, so, a GDP target and a social progress target. And that's then influencing budget allocations, policies and plans. So you see Paraguay as your big success at this point? Well, that's at a kind of country level. But mm -hmm. then what we found with the Amazon index is that that's now been adopted by state governors. Right. Uh, we heard from Eduardo La Roque this morning about how Rio is going to use it for the Pact for mm -hmm. Rio. Right. So really, it's about who finds this useful, wants to adapt it. I mean, in, in less than two years, we're now in 10 Latin American countries. Uh, this year, we've just done this deal with the European Commission, 28 countries. Right. We're starting partnerships with uh, states and cities in the US. The mayor of Somerville, Massachusetts is here. We've got an uh, agreement with Michigan. Um, and then, you know, 2016, maybe we might look at Africa and India. If we the mayor try. of Cali, Colombia is here and too. We should Cali, be getting, you know, him on board. Yeah. Thomas, the MDGs have had a pretty decent, you know, track record in terms of what they say is having you know, the share of people um, who live in abject poverty. But as you yourself had been sharing with me, um, the MDGs themselves are not always the ones that should be taking all the credit because um, we've seen such dramatic changes uh, in global poverty, you know, that have nothing to do with the MDGs. For example, in China, um, you know, the growth of China had a lot to do on with, with those figures. Um, you, uh, love to, I'd love to hear, hear a little bit about how you've learned from those lessons of the MDG process and what insights you can share with us about what needs to happen at the country level for the SDGs to be really embraced. Well, I, I think m maybe before I go to the, to the country level, just staying at the, okay. at the international level, I think what, what we learned in the last five years of the MDGs is that if we, if we build global uh, collaborations of collective action that involves also the private sector and, and civil society on in areas like say maternal health or energy it is possible to to make advance advances much faster mm -hmm. and 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 much broader than than if we only focus on mm -hmm. government to government and government right. to to UN interaction and that actually mobilizing broad alliances of actors behind uh, the various goals can be extremely effective. And if you look at energy 
and, and that's maybe also the problem I have with some of Bjorn's work, is that, that if you take a very static uh, look at a certain set of, of indicators in a year, it doesn't show you progress over time, and it mm -hmm. doesn't get into the dynamics of how you, uh, how you generate social change. Right. And if you take uh, the cost of renewable energy, say solar energy, it's come down to by 85 to 90 percent over the last 10, 12 years, much, much faster than any predictions by even the International right. Energy Agency. And right. that has been driven by a combination of government policies, consumer action, uh, investments taken also against the best will of politicians. Beyond, it's not all populism. There are actually politicians who make decisions also about things that are 50 years into the future and do it having a cost today, but knowing that the cost will come down tomorrow or 10 years from now. And I think th those kinds of policies that are then taken not only in one country, but across a range mm -hmm. of countries and also f for companies within their value chain across a number of markets and maybe even amongst <coughs> companies who get together and take a decision to say stop deforestation in their supply chain, which happened at the climate summit last, last year, that can in, even in a pre-competitive space change the whole a whole market over time. Right. So, so unleashing those kind of forces in a, in a collective push to achieve goals, I think, can be done at scale and much more, mm -hmm. uh, much faster and much more aggressively than we've done in the past. And then translating those sort of global alliances then into work at country level where you get mm -hmm. not only governments but also private sector and the civil society engaged in, in actually achieving these goals. I, I think can be very powerful and, and will be the way of the future, really. Brave man. It's amazing. I mean, when you think about the challenge of bringing all those stakeholders together around, you know, these issues. Bjorn, just very quickly, do you have any response to um, Thomas's uh, interesting, you know, his well, I, 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 actually, two things. First, first, uh, uh, Thomas, of course, very quickly went over to the 17 goals instead of the 169. I think it's important to recognize <coughs> that uh, uh, you know when we look at the MDGs, everything we remember about the MDGs that were the targets, not the goals. And you know, quite frankly, we just really need one goal: make a better world. But then we're done. It's all in the targets in the actual things that we're promising. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're going to find it very, very hard to sell the SDGs. I mean, honestly, I think we've been probably one of the people, we, we published 1,800 articles in the last year in papers around the, uh, the world. We have uh, almost, uh, uh, we have 24 articles in the East African, mm -hmm. 24 articles in, in Times of uh, India, and many, many other uh, uh, papers around the world talking about what are smart things in, uh, in the SDGs. But when I go out and talk to people, look guys, we're actually deciding what we should be doing the next 15 years. People are like, what? I haven't heard about that. Nobody's heard about that. And it's really, really hard to get people excited about 169 targets. And so just to go, go to, to the specific one on, on, uh, on renewable energy, um, uh, and, and that it's absolutely true that they have gotten much cheaper. Of course, the problem is that they're still not cheap. Uh, and, and that's why you know, we're spending, uh, the International Energy Agency has to wait, we're spending about $120 billion a year in, in subsidies. But remember, they also estimate that in 2040, the world will be spending about $200 billion a year in inflation adjusted, so actual real increase in subsidies of renewables in 2040. So it's not like uh, you know, in 2016. We're spending $500 or billion on fossil fuels today. And the, po the point is... Which is driving us over the cliff. Yes, but... but so what's okay. the point? Thomas, we need... To, that, that's just intellectually unrigorous. Those are two very, very <laughs> different things, right? Let's no. remember that the fossil fuel subsidies, which is one of the 19 proposals from our mm -hmm. experts, from our Nobel laureates, we should cut that. Remember, that goes to places like in, in uh, Venezuela, where they're subsidizing uh, gasoline with 92%. That's stupid, ridiculous, and of course we shouldn't be doing that. But that's a very different thing than saying we should be buying more uh, renewable energy. It makes us all feel good, especially in the Western world. But of course, remember that it actually costs, we estimate the benefits will be in the order of $400 billion a year but the cost will be in the order of $500 billion a year. That's why we're saying it's actually not a good deal right now to promise renewables, uh, to yeah, doubling but, but renewables. Bjorn, but and Bjorn, one of the things is they go, well, what good is it to have these other goals when there's no planet? Yeah, yeah, and, and a lot of people, <laughs> and, and a lot of people like to point that out. I, and I think 
that's probably where we really need to have an understanding that global warming is somehow being posited as the defining issue of our time. It's right. the only thing that matters. Let's just remember the UN Climate Panel report in, uh, that came out in 2013-2014 right. uh, indicated that global warming around 2070 uh, will cost somewhere between 0.2 and 2% of GDP per year. That's not a trivial cost. But also remember the UN Climate Panel estimate that by then we'll be somewhere between 800 and 1,000 percent richer. So yes, it is a problem. No, it's by no means the defining issue of our time. It's not the end of the world. And if you don't posit it like that, if you don't say this is the end of the world, so everything else has to wait, you, we've got to go back. The UN actually did, and I'm sure you know, uh, the, wor the World We Want survey, where they've surveyed 7 million people. What do you actually want? And inconveniently, you almost can't find the survey anymore on their website because it, it, I'm, I'm assuming it's because it's not very uh, politically correct. Uh, but it turns out that of 16 areas that we've asked 7 million people to, uh, to, uh, to uh, rank, they rank global warming as number 16. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't also f focus on this. I mean, we're, we're smart civilization. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. But we have to be careful that we don't chew so much gum that we forget to walk there. I'm not sure you can push the, the metaphor there. But let me just, one, one, one thing, and I think this is, this is sort of the, 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 the issue, the, uh, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paper from Center for Global Development. They looked at, oh, you know, Obama has promised to help electrify Africa. Wonderful idea. Of course, electrification is absolutely right. crucial. Right. Uh, it looks like almost all, or all of that is going to happen with renewables. So they looked at what, how many people can you lift out of darkness and poverty with renewables for $10 billion, which is probably what the Obama administration is going to spend. The answer is 20 million people. That's wonderful. 20 million people who don't have to suffer in darkness, mm -hmm. who we can help lift out uh, of, of, of poverty. I love that. But they also did the survey, how much, the study, how, mu how many people could we lift out for the same $10 billion using gas electrification? And the answer is 90 million people. Mm -hmm. So our conce the consequence of us focusing on renewables rather than the cheapest way to generate electricity is that we leave 70 million people in darkness. And I think we've got to be honest about that. There's a real trade-off. Thomas, you're burning to say something. <laughs> I, I, I didn't hear Bjorn's factoring in the coming down of prices with 90% over the last 10 years. You're still, you're still applying a very static <coughs> based on today's price and oh, a projection perfect. of that into the future. And, and frankly, I, I, I think that's where political leaders also make hard, hard choices. Um, if the world is not going over a cliff, I, I don't want to live in a six degree world. And, and I don't want my children to live in a six degree world. And the consequences of driving in the track that the world is currently on are, are beyond comprehension for most people. It's, just, it's not just a trivial fact of 0.7 or 2% of GDP. What we're talking about and what even major economists like Lord Stern are saying is that it will take a, a, a redirection of current investments in global infrastructure across energy, cities, transport, land use, in the vicinity of maybe up to $6 trillion per year in the next 15 years to get us onto a different course. Otherwise, we're fried. Uh, and that's not trivial, Bjorn. I mean, yeah. I just got, sorry, I just okay. got to say, no, we, obviously we don't use the idea, OK, they've been coming down 90%, now it's going to stop. Of course we don't do that. And all the models are I indicating that we'll continue in that path. But the problem is you still have to have backup power. You still need batteries. You still need what do you do when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining. The second part is, and that's crucial, you can't just make up it's going to fry. You've got to look at what the UN Climate Panel tells us. It's 0.2 to 2%. I know that that doesn't feel good. You, you quote Stern. So I mean, honestly, Stern is when you look across the impact of global warming across all the mm -hmm. uh, period estimates, Stern is in the 99th percentile. So that's not, that's not how we make good policy by picking the guy who tells us what we want to hear rather than what's probably true. Michael, I'm going to pick on you. Mm. What do you think of these two <laughs> back and forth? <laughs> I Take a position. I, I think they're terrific guys. Huh? You know, I've never met a nicer pair of people. <laughs> <laughs> no, truly, any comment? Um, 
I don't think, well, not, not, Come I on, you I, went I, to I Oxford. I don't, this I, don't, is a I don't know the numbers well enough. Yeah. I think that we have got into this really, really important issue is that this stuff is hard. Prioritization is hard. There's a whole system about issues about sequencing. You know, and about whether we want something now or tomorrow. Right. And I think a really important point, I think Bjorn is pushing towards, is the fact that especially when you're thinking about real poverty and destitution, the short term really, really matters. Because if I ain't fed and I'm dead within five years, then the short term really matters a yeah. lot more than the long term. Yeah. And I think True. there's a danger that we've got if we're thinking about how we're managing this debate, is making sure that all voices are represented in this debate. Mm -hmm. And I, I would also say, if you look at the MDGs themselves, I mean, I was working in government at this time, working on international development. The MDGs also do reflect a lot of arrogance of the donor countries and about the choices. I was very struck, when, I think it was 1999, the World Bank produced a report, The Voices of the Poor, <laughs> that talked about the importance of safety to poor people and the level of trust there was in faith institutions. None of that featured in the MDGs. And I think mm -hmm. it's it, you know, setting that agenda is really, really important. Okay. Yeah. And I don't envy uh, Thomas his job. It's a really hard conversation. I, very, I mean, I get emailed right. by people saying, will you support X, Y, and Z being part of the SDGs? Yeah? I mean, it's an absolute nightmare process because people know the stakes are so high. The MDGs got passed because no one knew how much they'd matter. Mm -hmm. yeah? The MDGs have been successful. They've galvanized effort. They've focused attention. And that's why it's such a high stakes game. Interesting. And I think it's going to be really, really tough to manage. And I think in the end, it's going to be about uh, a consensus, a sort of UN committee based response. And I think it's going to be for the people in this room right. to turn that what will inevitably be, inevitably be an unsatisfactory right. compromise right. into meaningful measures that can uh, inspire and engage people in finding solutions. Thomas, you raised your hand, you want to yeah, no, retire I, early? No, I think the, the, the survey that Bjorn referenced, the world we want, um, it's true that climate change comes out of the bottom, but I also think, and, and that's the survey also shows that, it's because most people have a very abstract relationship <laughs> to the concept of climate change. Mm -hmm. But when you ask them about uh, coastal zone management, uh, uh, heavy rain downpours, mm -hmm. um, uh, sustainable food production and, and you break down climate change into its components, then most people around the world want to see action and they want to see it happening. And actually the SDGs have one target on, on or one goal on climate change, but they have climate action embedded in, in 12 of them. Okay. And, uh, yeah. and the climate summit that the Secretary General organized last year um, mobilized uh, just sort of on Twitter, half of the world's Twitter users with a total of three billion footprints over Twitter. Wow. So, so there was a, there's a clear global conversation and global interest mm -hmm. in taking action and, and in, in finding the political will to also put the solutions on the table. And I think actually it's a wrong, it's a wrong uh, uh, presentation to say that economic action and, right. and, and climate action are, are opposites. Right, actually right, they right. are complementary oh, and sure. part of the same, sure. of the same sure. push. Let's hear from Dorothy Patrick and Bunker. Dorothy, tell us about, are the SDGs, MDGs, SPIs of the world, are they relevant to what you do at Youth Build? Yes and no. That okay. is, we would like it if they adopted some goals that were consistent with what we want to do. Uh, they haven't. Um, and so I should explain a little bit what we measure. We, because we, we work with the generation of young people between 16 and 24 who are out of school, out of work, on the street, lost to society, not being productive and being sent to jail and being killed. So there's this force that could be a positive force, which it currently is a drain. Uh, there's 6.7 million in the United States. There's 354 million globally. So 354 million unemployed young people who are not in school and not in work worldwide. They don't turn up here. <laughs> they need to turn up uh, because in our judgment at Youth Build, uh, if you can unleash that group as a positive force, if you can help them rebuild their communities and rebuild their lives, you've shifted, you've changed the equilibrium, if you will, and you've captured the, the issues of poverty this is a group of young people who are going to raise the next generation in poverty unless they find a way to climb out and become leaders who change the conditions of poverty. And if they do, then you could break the cycle of poverty in a generation. 
Now, so what do we measure? So we start by, uh, well, uh, let me back up for a second. So our goal uh, for our field in the United States is to create systems which will reconnect a million young people a year to education employ and employment, education and or employment. A million a year dropping out of high school, if you can reconnect a million a year at a slightly older rate, you could fix that. Um, that's a big number. Youth build only in, in the 260 local programs that we support in the United States, we only have 10,000 a year. So we have to collaborate with others to try and reach more like a millennium goal of a million a year. And we are doing that collaboration. But where we started 25 years ago and we began to measure was we said, OK, let's ask the young people, ask the local uh, providers, local nonprofits, what should we measure? What are our um, measurable objectives? We're not going to be able to measure the big stuff, the immeasurable things about well-being and happiness and leadership and change. What should we measure? So they set the objectives, and we've measured them for 25 years. Measure how many people apply, because it's an indication of, of how well you're doing in your reputation and whether you're meeting the need. Measure how many people come every day. Measure attendance, because it reflects whether the young people are getting the experience that will keep them coming. Measure academic gains, academic achievement in terms of high school diploma or GED, industry recognized credentials, completion of the total program, placement in jobs or post secondary education, retention in jobs or post secondary education, and recidivism rates uh, for those who've had mm -hmm. previous problems with the law. We measure them monthly, annually. We we provide funds in relation to them. We give lots of study time for people to do it. Extremely important to measure. Extremely important to use it as a learning process and to have those systems in place. And when we started, all of these local nonprofits had no idea how to maintain data. So we had to teach. And so that, that's an important piece. Um, now, does it help when the government, so we, we have government funding coming into this system. We encourage the government to hold people accountable for outcomes, uh, but when they do it too rigidly, it creates a negative effect. The negative effect is staff begin to focus on the numbers because they want to get funded. The young people say, hey, they don't care about us. They care about the numbers. If they don't care about us, we're not coming. The heck with this. And so the, the negative effect of too much attention on data can be you know, quite direct on at the bottom line. Now, in these systems, there's a, f uh, there's a few kinds of things I don't think are being captured. Like, how, how about ca getting some measures for uh, correcting injustice <laughs> or for decreasing incarceration as a reflection of injustice or decreasing incarceration that is disproportionately directed at young black men in the United States? Where does that fit in these systems? Um, how do we, uh, where, do, where is extreme inequality? I, mean, I don't see it in the book, right? So if extreme inequality isn't something we want to decrease, then I'm not quite sure how these worldwide goals really affect the long range well being of people living on this planet. Of course, I do agree. Bottom line, preserve the planet, top priority, so that we can have the time that it's going to take to create a society in which every human being has a chance to fulfill their potential. Patrick, I'm going to ask you, do you relate to what Dorothy's saying in terms of um, the insights that she's working with young people, you're working with young people in Ghana? Talk a little bit about the relevance of these types of goal setting and, and in terms of your work at Ashesi University. Right, so the um, MDGs first came to my consciousness when I was thinking about leaving Microsoft and, and getting into education. And it, it became very clear to me that the whole world was focused on primary education, but also the world seemed to be saying that higher education did not matter, secondary education did not matter. Um, and I disagreed with that. A lot of people disagreed with that. Um, in our environment, we need um, a lot of capacity building across the board and we need to look at education as a systems problem not just 
you know, sort of partition it out and say this one is more important than others. Um, but I should also say that the fact that the world was saying primary education needed to be solved was comforting to me. I thought that that was actually a good, a good goal to, to educate everyone and to eliminate illiteracy um, in our countries. Um, and I felt, well, if all the development partners and all the big guys are focusing on that problem, then individuals like me and, and my team could work on some other problems which are also important, right? And so that's, that's where we got to. But I think that this question of what you measure is extremely important. Uh, so if, if I were to ask, what would you think if I said, let's have a development goal that says, um, over the next 15 years, let's get every kid who's on a farm off the farm and into a temporary holding cell, uh, and that's it. And this is a goal of the world. We would all say, absolutely not, right? It doesn't make any sense. And yet, two years ago, Ghana's um, education assessment um, which c included 37,000 kids, 170 districts across the country, tested at third grade and sixth grade, found that 50% of these kids could not read at all. They couldn't read a word. 40% could, could read words, but with no comprehension. So 90% illiterate. Uh, 2% could read fluently with comprehension, and the balance could read with difficulty and, and some comprehension. So why did this happen? Well, there's this pressure to get every kid in school, because right. that's how the goal was described. Right. There wasn't pressure to educate every kid. And, and there wasn't, um, the goal didn't, uh, consider the fact that we needed to build capacity. If you're going to increase enrollments, you also actually need to increase supply. You need more schools, you need more teachers, you need a lot of work in curriculum. Um, there's, there's some things that you needed to do which weren't done, and so we just stuffed more kids into the same classrooms right, right. with the same teachers. Um, with what I think really awful results. And, and I'm glad that the, the new set of goals are paying more attention to quality um, and to outcomes. But I do think that you should, uh, Michael, you should, um, in the SPIs, you know, Michael Porter's graph showed, you know, one of the graphs that we had done really well and was in education. <laughs> we've not, if, we've, if they're just temporary holding cells, okay? so. So we do need to take this measurement question very seriously, and it's something that we need to figure out now and do now and not say, well, it's going to be done over, t over time. Um, the second thing is um, I feel that we need to talk a lot about purpose. Why, why is a goal a goal? Um, in education, we should be thinking about not just knowledge acquisition. We should be thinking about skills. Mm -hmm. we, should, we should be thinking about character formation. We're trying to build humanity. We're trying to build societies. And you need kids who are literate, who are numerate, who respect each other, who understand the importance of sanitation, et cetera, et cetera. And so from my perspective, I think that, well, first of all, I think goal setting is a good thing. Um, and I'm glad that it's happening. I think it's really important to set priorities. I think it's really important to be very clear about what we're measuring um, and, 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 and hold countries accountable to that, f to the results. Um, and I also think, which has, has already been said, that we, we need to realize that some problems are systems problems. And and the goal has to be a system right. goal. Absolutely. Thank you. Bunker, now in 2008, you wrote a scathing editorial 
in the New York Times that every, woke everybody up where you critiqued the MDGs, and I'm going to quote from that 2008. You said, any goal that is driven from the top by international donors and governments not accountable to the communities and without financial transparency is doomed to fail. When poor communities think at the human level, all their goals are interconnected. But under the present top-down model, with the absence of a global grassroots movement with the communities as equal partners, the goals have been broken up compartmentally into project made to suit donors and governments. So given the massive effort that the UN has deployed this time in coming up with the uh, multiple SDG goals, targets, et cetera, how do you feel about that formulation? How do you feel about what's been, you know, Copenhagen consensus as well, SPI? Shed light on that from your perspective. Loud enough? You know what happens is it's being recorded. Your famous words forever. Oh, God. <laughs> is, it is it open? Yeah? On? Who are these goals for? Who are these targets for? If it's for the rural poor globally, they have not been consulted. Governments don't represent the rural poor. They're so far away from the remote villages around the world that they are just not connected to these very poor people who live on less than one dollar a day, what Mahatma Gandhi called the last man and woman. So I think, with due respect, these goals are a joke because it doesn't relate to the lifestyle and the work style and the realities of rural communities living around the world who are living a survival, hand-to-mouth survival existence. To me, if that consultation doesn't happen and they have not institutionalized that, consultants, that, um, that uh, consultation with the very poor, then these goals do not mean a thing. Right now, what, do we, what are we doing? Let me just give you some brief. What we are doing for the last 10 years is to take illiterate rural grandmothers who have never left their villages in their lives and through sign language, make them into solar engineers, and they go and solar electrify their villages where they come from in six months. Now we hear of Jeff Sachs, who's spending $2.5 million in one village. And we wonder, you know, if we had $2.5 million, <laughs> we would be able to solar electrify 20,000 houses train 300 grandmothers, and cover the whole continent of Africa. Is this a model that the UN is pushing? Is this a model that people are talking about as the model which is sustainable? It's a joke. We have to be able to go down to the very poor people and ask them what their goals are, and they will be totally different from some of these goals that some have been designed up in New York or somewhere in Geneva or wherever. We have to be able to demystify and decentralize these goals and make it much more relevant right down to the very poor and make them feel that they can manage, control, and own those goals. How do we manage to do that? That is the most important issue today for me. So what do we focus on? We focus on making communities self-reliant. We focus on communities actually identifying their own goals and actually making it happen because it's in their own hands. We actually try and see whether those skills, knowledge, and wisdom that are required, which are absolutely marginalized or totally neglected, not even recognized in the main scheme of things, how do we bring them into mainstream? That is where the goals have to actually address. The basic minimum needs, light, water, work, what more do you want? If you have light, water, and work in the most remote rural communities around the world, why should anyone in his sense migrate to cities? How do we prevent migration? How do we make people live with dignity and self-respect in those very communities they come from? This is the issues today. 
And people are so far away when they establish these goals. It's unbelievable how detached they are from very these very communities we're working with. We went to 34 of the least developed countries around the world, including the continent of Africa, and we asked them, do you know anything about these goals? And they're looking like blank. <laughs> who, who, what are these goals? Who's consulted them? Who's talked to them? It's all at the government level and the international level. It hasn't really percolated down to the poop. And they will have a completely different set of goals which you may not agree with. But you have to accept them and you have to respect them. Now, I don't know how we're going to address this whole issue of goals, targets, because if you're not involving the real communities who these targets and rules were for, it's not going to work. Sorry. Thank you. Ben. Okay. I'm going to open the uh, floor to your comments and questions and to the panel and to our three you know, entrepreneurs here on the ground. Um, and just throw out a challenge to you. If you had to pick three goals, what would they be? But let's first open the floor. Charmian. Sorry. I'm still actually thinking of your comments. Can you here. introduce yourself? Oh. And, okay. Hi, I'm Charmian. I'm with Volens. And Bunker, I'm still sort of reflecting on what you've said here. So this question, actually, I'd like to, in some ways, get your reaction to it as well as others. But um, you know, this conversation has reminded me of a quote from Peter Backer, who said, accountants will save the world. Um, and, and people often laugh at that, but I, I, the more I'm seeing, the more I'm thinking that actually might be, might be true. And so my question to you all, what, are, what is the role for accountancy companies in answering these two questions? What should we focus on? And perhaps more importantly, you know, how will we be measuring success? Okay, let's take a next, Mrs. Michelle. My name is Grace Michelle. I want to uh, state here that I am one of the culprits <laughs> of having produced uh, some recommendations of the Sustainable Development Goals. I am a, a member of the panel which was established by the Secretary General to uh, advise on the goals. So. I want to take that very clearly, <laughs> that uh, responsibility. Second, I want to say that I'm not so sure whether the issue are the goals or the issue is how government works, how government work. If we read the and I'm not trying to protect myself <laughs> and the panel. But if you read the goals which says, I mean, we should in 30 years, uh, I mean, 15 years, make sure that no one goes hungry and no one is left behind. I doubt that there will be anyone in the world, whether it's rural, whether it's slum, who is going to disagree with that? Because it's a very basic. It's just to have food on the table for everybody. And not only food, then we say nutritious food. Second, if you look at some of the goals which you say, and uh, I'm with you, education and quality education. Whether it is a child in rural area or in a slum or it's in a developed country or it's uh, and a developed country, the education for all and the life with dignity, I would doubt that there will be someone sensible who will say, oh no, we should not strive, try to get education for all children knowing that it today in terms of knowledge, in terms of capacity, in terms of means to make it, if we change the way we do things, it is possible to provide education to every child. So I think we, 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 should, we, should, we should have a discussion here which would uh, also touch on the institutional frameworks which we have, how these institutions work, 
how this institution, I agree with you in terms of consultation, for instance. In my country, I come from Mozambique, and I run a very small organization, which is a foundation. We did work with UN to do the consultation you are, work, you are talking about, to consult ordinary people in selected villages, in selected districts, et cetera, et cetera. So at least, I'm not saying we did it perfectly. I'm saying there was a process, an attempt to consult certain people who are representative of different segments of our people. What I'm trying to say here, it's not that the goals are good mm -hmm. or bad. I agree that, I mean, the targets, maybe there are too many for people to remember and to implement them. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't focus on, uh, in my language, what do they say? You throw away, I mean, the baby and the water. Yeah. Because yeah. there are things which are not working. I think the, 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 it was quite sad here. One of the recommendations we made, it was to say, look, the reason why MDGs, for instance, were not implemented in full, not only because they were decided in New York without consultation, it's also because they were not even taken back to people who are relevant to it. To the end of MDGs, there are people who have never heard of MDGs. You ask them 15 years down the line, they never heard about it. But it is about water, it is about food, it is about education. The process of how you implement this is equally important as the way you decide what you are going to do. So what we recommended as a panel, and again, I'm not saying we did right. We said this time, we need two things. One is that every single country, once the universal goals have been agreed upon, has to take these goals back home mm -hmm. and ask, how does it work for me? Because the way it's going to work in India, it's not going to be exactly the same way it's going to work in Mozambique. The way it's going to work in Niger, it's not exactly the same way where it's going to work in Thailand. Every single country will say, these are the global agreements, mm -hmm. but how do I domesticate them into my own reality? This is one. To do that, you need to build a social pact in which this morning I was in one of the sessions where they were talking about. You bring to the same table government, private sector, academia, non-profit organizations, mm -hmm. uh, peasants associations, unions, you name it. I mean, all the people and say, how are we going to transform this agenda mm -hmm. into our reality? And you go as down, actually, to involve communities, community leaders, in which you shouldn't forget women, and I'll say 100 times women, <laughs> and young people. <laughs> And young people. and young people, then you do, yes, yes, because in terms of majorities, at least in Africa, our three major majorities are this, are women, they are more than 50%, are young people, and it varies from one country to country. Third, it's rural people. Mm -hmm. These are the three majorities of our realities. So if you want to be democratic, at least these three groups have to have a say in what is going to happen. So. If you bring this into a social pact, in which also you say, but are we institutionally organized to keep the voices of these people and to keep them engaged in implementation? This is a question which mm -hmm. many of our countries should ask. Right. And finally, we said, we recommended that not only you agree on this pact, but you need to have an implementation process. How are you going to implement yeah. it? And we suggested that 2015 should be a year of one, domestication, second, to set up, I mean, the implementation process. So implementation itself mm -hmm. will happen from 2017 if we are to be taken seriously. Precisely to avoid this situation where, because we don't have those processes in place, we don't have an implementation, and we include accountability process.
into it. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say, one, I go back. I take responsibility of him participating on this. Second, there was an attempt of consultation, which of course it was not perfect, but it, it, it was. Second, I don't think that the problem are with the goals. I think the problem, if you read the goals, they are not really saying something which is extraordinary. It talks of but dignity for every single human being. And above that, I don't think we disagree. What we do have is how our governments do work. How do they perform? How they, pe they relate to their people? How do they manage the public good? Civil society organizations can try, and they are trying to do their best, mm -hmm. sometimes to correct what the governments are, 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 are not doing. But you know what is the problem? Is that they will do in a small scale. Right. They will right. never be able to be nationally because they don't have the capacity. They don't have the, the, the resources mm -hmm. to do that. So I just want to recommend we need to change the way our governments are working because in essence, they are using our money. It's public money. They are managing. Yeah. They are our managers, but we don't keep them accountable for how they manage the money we put into the national treasury mm -hmm. as a national pocket. So yeah. that's, uh, that's what I wanted to, to, to say on this and saying <laughs> none of the profits will be. <laughs> I, think, I think we all agree with you, Grasa. Everybody here would totally agree with it, that it's process even, you know, I'm sure that that would be the case. I want to give you guys a chance to respond to also to Charmian's question. Bjorn? Let me disagree with you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I disagree with everything. Yeah. No, no but, 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 but I think, and, and in some ways it also t uh, uh, ties back to your question. Of course, everyone wants a better plan. We want our kids fed. We want to fix global warming. We want to get less indoor air pollution. We want all good things. But in reality and uh, realistically, over the next 15 years, we're not going to manage all of it. And so our concern is if we sort of focus, we, we tried to do this very, and, and it, it's only an order of magnitude estimate. If you try to do it across all these areas, if you just try to spend, say, $10 billion across all these areas, every dollar spent will do about $7 worth of good. That's great. But if you focus it on the best targets instead and just spend the money there, you will do more than four times more good. You'll do $32 worth of good. So you'll do a lot more. That's like quadrupling global aid. And so my point here is essentially, yes, I would love to get governments to be more efficient. I'd love to be, uh, get governments to do what they were supposed to do. But I think if we, if we ask them to do fewer things that are harder to screw up, they will more likely actually end up having done a lot of good in 2030. And so in some sense, that's where the accountants come in, right? Let's make sure that we predominantly focus on the targets where we can, we, we know it's really, really hard not to do a lot of good and not so much on the targets where, where it's really hard to do a lot of good. I, I mean, I think, Grassi, your, your final comment I thought really got to the heart of it, which is ultimately this is about po politics holding leaders to account by citizens and making these things part of the political debate in the sense of who gets elected, the promises politicians make. And I guarantee one way to make sure it doesn't get part of the political debate is calling it the Sustainable Development Goals. <laughs> uh, so I've uttered that phrase the last time in my life. I'm now only going to speak about the people's goals. Uh, that's, they're, they're now the people's goals. Um, and then the second thing is don't have 17 of them. Yeah? I mean, 17 just confuses everything. And again, I think Grasser got to the nub of it, which is that there's a, there's a fundamental idea underlying it. And I think you know, the eight MDGs, the fact there were eight was not very good. But what the MDGs did have was an underlying concept, poverty, extreme poverty. So whatever you spoke about the different MDGs, everyone kind of knew what it was. And you had things like the Make Poverty History campaign. There needs to be an underlying concept for these people's goals. This, that's because it's got to be communicated in a simple form that can then become part of the political debate. So the politicians stand up and they'll say, you know, you should vote for me because GDP went up and we made progress on this. 
Yeah? And, but it's got to be part of the politics. It's got to be part of that political debate. It's not technocratic. It's not about a complex plan. It's not about 17 goals. And that's that conversion that's really crucial. Patrick. So um, I agree that actually um, most people in the world, rural poor, urban poor, everyone would agree that the goals um, as stipulated make a lot of sense. They, they would benefit from them. I do think that uh, in order to determine whether the goals were partly to blame or not, it's useful to consider the goals that were in fact met or close to, were close to met. So the goals around um, infant mortality, for example, the world made a lot of progress on that. Um, because the way the goal was stated, it was very clear. It didn't say, um, and, and infant mortality was addressed through a variety of means, community health centers, clinics, hospitals, tertiary clinics, and so on. It wasn't, let's make it possible for every kid to go to a community health center. It wasn't phrased as something like that. Um, whereas if you look at the education goal, um, and consider the Brookings Institution report, mm -hmm. the failure happened in a lot of countries. If it happened in just a handful of countries, you could say, well, maybe those governments didn't get it right. But those same governments got the infant mortality goal right, and so many governments got the education thing wrong, which tells us that we need to look at how that goal was stated. And so, um, I, I, I do think that there's something to looking at the goals themselves as being, and, and there's a lot of, um, there's, a lo there, there's a lot of positive that came out of the MDGs around, uh, around poverty, around uh, maternal care, infant uh, mortality, et cetera. Um, and, I, and so I think that gives me hope that if goals are stated properly, um, that we can, in fact, achieve them. Bjorn, you were going to... Oh, just very, very briefly, uh, on, on the very education thing, there's a wonderful article, uh, meta, meta study on all the efforts of, of, of increasing quality uh, in uh, education, uh, about 10,000 studies since 1998, 89. Uh, and unfortunately, the answer is we almost don't know. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why when we ask our economists, they don't say so much education. They say the roundabout way of nutrition, because if you get kids good nutrition, even if they go to crappy schools, they still learn more. And so it, it goes back to that sort of accounting thing that, that you know, sometimes a roundabout way might actually be a better way to get better education outcomes. Thomas? Well, ultimately, the, the question was asked, uh, 17 goals, can we make it simpler? In a, in a way, these 17 goals all represent a mix of, of uh, social goal, social action, environmental action, and, and economic action. Um, eradicating extreme poverty, uh, keeping the world under the two degree threshold, and having equitable growth. Mm -hmm. and, and it's sort of the trinity of, of, of this that is being brought back together in a way. Whereas in the last 25 years, since the Rio conference in 1992, the world has been going about it in, in, in separate paths. We've had one approach to poverty, economics has been dealt with somewhere else, mm -hmm. and, and the environment has been dealt with in a climate negotiation mm -hmm. track that nobody really understands. Right, right, and in, right. a way, in a way, this is an attempt right. to bring it all together into a more comprehensive framework. And of course, you need to engage the people and, and the populations, but as I think Ms. Michelle has also indicated, that is also a national government right. role. I mean, the UN is trying to help to do it, but these goals is not something that UN technocrats have dreamt up. They have been produced and negotiated by the right. governments right. at the UN. And, and so it's the people that these governments represent that ultimately that, that's where the, also the interaction has, mm -hmm. has to happen. Absolutely. Of course the UN can try to help sure. and, and will, but there is also a government responsibility ultimately. Bunker, you wanted to say something? Briefly. Yeah, because we're running out of time. Um, I was also on the Secretary's <coughs> panel on sustainable energy for all. And we produced this citizen's report, uh, which was totally trashed by all the members because they couldn't understand a word. Because it was a people's report. We just said the most important thing was to decentralize 
was instead of centralized power plants, why don't you decentralize like, right down to the community and village level and household level so that they take ownership of it? They couldn't understand a word. And how do we manage to communicate this simple message that you have to take the people into confidence and use the technology, resources, and skills of the very poor people to do that, rather than get an engineer from outside to do it. These people can have the capacity and competence to do it themselves, but they didn't get it. They trashed that report. They said this is, uh, the Secretary General will not accept it. I said, well, this is our, say, our report, and this is our report. This is what the people think. This is what civil society thinks. And you have to take this seriously, because this is what the people think on the ground didn't happen. Okay, I, I want again, sorry to, to take up this. I think again is this very important section you raised. Why, why don't we dis decentralize? Why don't we take into, exactly what you said, take into confidence, I mean people, and in one country actually, you have such a diversity that what, what works sometimes for one district it's not going to work exactly the same way in another district. So why don't we decentralize? When maybe my, my, my English also is not, you know, I'm a, I'm a Portuguese speaking, so I don't, I, don't, I don't express myself properly in English. When I say, when I say, no, 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 no. I was trying, I w when I'm trying to say, we need to look at the, the how would we did institutionalize the institutions we were, we have maybe one of the big issues you raised quite rightly why don't we decentralize why don't we force our governments to decentralize you know but yeah but the problem again we i mean people sitting around here we represent civil society organizations we represent academics etc 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 we vote on these governments again exactly. and again. Why don't we force them to change? That's what my point is. Right. Because it is at the end of the day, those who give our governments to continue to do the kind of things they do, it's the vote we deposit on them. Why do we, we don't force them to decentralize? Thank you very much for this very interesting conversation. <laughs>